أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم نشرح لك صدرك ووضعنا أنك وذرك الذي أنقذ ذهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يسرا مع العسر يسرا فإذا فرعت فعنصب وإلا ربك فرغب صدق الله العلي Yali Madad, Assalamu Alaikum and welcome. My name is Salim Banji and I'm the president for the Ismaili Council for Ontario. I am thrilled to join you from the Ismaili Centre Toronto, an iconic landmark surrounded by the beautiful Aga Khan Park and the Aga Khan Museum. The Ismaili Centre Toronto is one of six centres located across the world that host discussions and discourses on topics of contemporary interest to enhance the intellect and promote pluralistic engagement between communities. Today, we are virtually hosting a program to commemorate Yome Ali, the birthday of Caliph Imam Ali, who was the cousin and son-in-law of Prophet Muhammad Peace be upon him and his family. Caliph Imam Ali was born on 13th Rajab in the year 599 Common Era. It is said that on the day of his birthday, Caliph Imam Ali's mother visited the Holy Kaaba to pray, and it was there that he was born. During his life, Caliph Imam Ali exemplified the ethics of care, compassion, generosity, integrity, tolerance, forgiveness, brotherhood, and service to others. His words, no honor is like knowledge, no belief is like modesty and patience, no attainment is like humility, no power is like forbearance, and no support is more reliable than consultation remain ever so relevant after 1400 years. Caliph Imam Ali's words light our collective paths and guide us on how to successfully meet the challenges of our contemporary world. I would now like to welcome Dr. Hadi Inayat, who will be our keynote speaker today on the topic of social justice and the new world order. Dr. Inayat is a political sociologist and visiting lecturer at the Aga Khan University Institute for the study of Muslim civilizations in London, England. I am also delighted to introduce Dr. Nadia Ibu Jamal, who will be joining Dr. Inayat in conversation. Dr. Jamal is a prominent lecturer, historian, and author with an area of focus on the history of Muslim societies. Dr. Jamal graduated from Manchester University with an honors degree in Islamic studies. She went on to complete her master's and PhD from the School of Near Eastern Literatures and Languages at New York University, where she specialized in medieval Persian history with an emphasis on the Ismaili communities of the time. She has published several works, including Surviving the Mongols, Nizari Questini, and the continuity of Ismaili tradition in Iran. Dr. Jamal will provide a fulsome introduction on our keynote speaker. 
We are delighted to have both Dr. Hadi and Dr. Jamal with us today. Today's program will officially commence with the Holy Tilawat, a recitation of selection of Quranic verses, and conclude with musical expressions. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you all enjoy today's program. Kudafiz. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good day, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Bienvenue. Assalamu alaikum. Khush amadid. Yali madad. My name is Nadia Jamal, and as the moderator today, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event to commemorate the life of Khalif Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, the cousin and son-in-law of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Khalif Imam Ali is revered by all Muslims as the fourth of the rightly guided caliphs and by the Shi'i communities, their first Imam. Throughout time, across different geographical and cultural spheres, writers have extolled the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Poets have sung his praises, mystics and Sufis have called out his name in remembrance, Artisans have inscribed the saying, La Fata ila Ali, La Saifa ila Dhulfiqar, on buildings to showcase high moral conduct. And believers have sought his help in times of difficulties. Khalif Imam Ali is particularly renowned for his views on social justice. The famous letter to Malik al Ashtar, governor of Egypt, attributed to him remains a source of inspiration and hope for those clamoring for a better life. To that end, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Hadi Inayat. Dr. Inayat is a political sociologist and currently visiting lecturer at the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations, Aga Khan University, London. His book, Law, State, and Society in Modern Iran, Constitutionalism, Autocracy, and Legal Reform, 1906 to 1941, and Islam and Secularism in Post-Cold Colonial Thought, a Cartography of Recent Genealogies, are amongst his numerous publications, with several more in the pipeline. As a political sociologist with a humanistic sensibility, coupled with his experience as a journalist in the Middle East and his work on refugees, Dr. Inayat brings to bear a refreshing perspective on a topic that is so germane to today's conflicted world, a world that is crying out for a new social order based on mutual trust and human respect. After speaking for about 20 minutes, Dr. Inayat and I will be engaging in a conversation, during which I hope to try to extract some key messages for him to further elaborate on. Now it is my honor to call upon Dr. Inayat to speak to us on the topic of social justice, the new global order, a search from within Islam's own heritage. Thanks, Nadia. Hello, everybody. I'm very honoured to be invited today to speak on Yoma Ali. I'm going to talk today about an Islamic vision of social justice and what relevance it might have to some of the immense problems we face in the 21st century. First of all, what is social justice? It's a deeply contested concept and we won't discuss it in great depth here. But broadly speaking, social justice is about redistributive issues such as tackling poverty and inequality, improving access to resources for the poor, and tackling exploitation. Social justice isn't the same thing as charity because it's concerned with tackling these issues at a deeper structural level rather than through individual ch uh, donations of charity. This vision of social justice is articulated in different ways in a tradition called liberation theology. Liberation theology was first, ex uh, first found expression in the 1960s in Catholicism and its advocates such as Gustavo Gutierrez, who argued for a vision of social justice which synthesized Christian theology and socio-economic analysis. This was an understanding of Christianity which emphasized social concern for the poor and political liberation of oppressed peoples everywhere. 
But these ideas have found expression in other religious traditions, such as Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and indeed Islam. And in the past few decades, an Islamic liberation theology has emerged in the, word, in the works of Farid Asak, Askar Ali Engineer, Sabib Akhtar, and Ali Shariati. We're going to focus briefly today on the Iranian scholar and activist Ali Shariati and his understanding uh, of Shiism and the social justice espoused by Imam Ali. Shariati, who's widely seen as one of the leading ideologues of the 1979 revolution in Iran, was a Western educated intellectual with Marxist leanings who was influenced by the anti-colonial intellectual Franz Fanon. Shariati was convinced that only a revolutionary interpretation of Shiism could oust the tyrannical Pahlavi monarchy and liberate Iran from the clutches of Western imperialism. He believed that three factors contributed to what he saw as the Shah's triangle of oppression, wealth, coercion, and institutional religion. The latter, he argued, had manifested itself through what he referred to as black Shiism, which he regarded as a deviation from the essence of true Shiism, of the true Shiism practiced by Imam Ali. Moreover, he argued that black Shiism was exclusively preoccupied with spirituality and hair-splitting scholarly disputes, rather than social activism, which he regarded as uh, the, the true essence of Shiism. Shariati set out to correct this imbalance by restoring the true Shiism of Imam Ali, which he termed Red Shiism. This combined an emphasis on the individual's spiritual development with an activist conception of social justice. He spoke of Islam as the driver for an egalitarian society and redefined Islamic terms such as Tawheed and Jihad as social solidarity and liberation struggle, uh, respectively. In this light, Shariati depicted the Imams Ali and Hussein as revolutionaries who had stood up for the oppressed classes. Thus, Red Shiism was primarily about revolution and resistance against oppression, rather than seminary squabbles and mysticism. Shariati's message resonated with thousands of university students in Iran, to whom this progressive understanding of Shiism appealed greatly. He died shortly uh, uh, just before the 1979 revolution, but his vision of Imam Ali as a champion of spirituality and social justice still resonates with many people inside and outside Iran today. What relevance might an Islamic vision of social justice have to the contemporary world? I'll discuss this with reference to the crisis caused by the contemporary global regime of what are called intellectual property rights, which have severely restricted equal access to medicines for poorer countries. This is a particularly urgent issue in light of the unequal access to the coronavirus vaccines. Thus far, rich nations, representing just 14% of the world's population, have bought up 53% of all the most promising vaccines. These vaccines have been produced by pharmaceutical companies such as AstraZeneca, Moderna and Pfizer, amongst others, and their distribution and protection are protected by intellectual property rights enshrined in various international treaties. So what are intellectual property rights? They sound complicated, but the basic principles are really quite simple. They are rights given to persons over the creation of their minds, such as a book or a piece of music or a piece of artwork, or indeed a technological or medical innovation. They give the creator of a product an exclusive right over the use of his or her creation for a certain period of time, and usually take the form of patents, copyrights, or trademarks. For example, coronavirus vaccines are protected by patents which give the pharmaceutical companies which develop them the right to stop others from using the vaccine technology without their permission for the duration of the patent, which is usually about 20 years. Intellectual property rights are often justified with reference to Western political philosophers, such as the 17th century English philosopher John Locke, and are seen as beneficial to society because they reward innovators and at the same time maximise wealth creation. In the 19th and early 20th century, the global property rights regime was shaped by the colonial powers, including Britain, France, Germany, Spain, and later the United States. At this time, this regime was relatively open, 
So much so that in 1918, US Justice Louis Brandeis could claim that, and I quote him, knowledge becomes after voluntary communication to others, free as the air to common use. Indeed, why should anyone have exclusive rights, even if only temporarily, over goods that remain undiminished, such as knowledge, even after some have made use of them? Brandeis went on to argue that knowledge and innovation was never created out of thin air, and that everyone should be able to share the knowledge that has accumulated over the centuries. But just over a century after Justice Brandeis wrote these wise words, legal enclosure of the knowledge commons, of the knowledge that we, he thought we should have in common, has expanded much further than he could have imagined and a much more aggressive and exclusive global regime of intellectual property rights has emerged. Indeed, in 1980, Supreme Court Justice Warren E. Berger declared that intellectual property rights should extend to everything under the sun made by man. Since Justice Berger's declaration, intellectual property protection has expanded exponentially to cover not only genuine intellectual creations, but also facts, discoveries, information, and even aspects of nature, such as our genetic code. This more expansive concept of intellectual property rights was institutionalized globally through the TRIPS Agreement of 1995, which extended the scope of intellectual property rights to pharmaceutical products, thus creating severe roadblocks to access to medicine for poorer countries. Consequently, the expansion of property rights has not left everyone better off. And a large body of research indicates that the current doctrinal rationales and legal treaties which underpin the global intellectual property rights system effectively marginalizes fundamental human concerns, including access to medicine, educational materials, protection of traditional knowledge, and economic growth in developing countries. An example of this is when 39 ph pharmaceutical companies sued the South African government in 1998 when it passed legislation permitting the import of patented AIDS drugs. So, an alternative vision of global property systems is long overdue, not just for the sake of theoretical discussion, but because of the significant, significant flaws in the policy rationales for the current system and its harmful impact on poorer countries. What resources are there in the Islamic tradition for formulating a more equitable intellectual property rights regime? Muslim scholars are divided over this issue, with a minority claiming that the concept of intellectual property rights is not recognized in Islamic law, which does not recognize property rights to intangible, i.e. non-solid objects, such as uh, knowledge or culture. Thus, there should be no restrictions whatsoever on the dissemination of these things, and they are seen by some scholars as a kind of colonial imposition by the West. However, most Muslim scholars do recognize the legitimacy of intellectual property rights, but their views remain somewhat underdeveloped. An interesting example of recent thinking on this subject has been advanced by Eziadine Mahjoub, a law professor from the Swinburne University of Technology in Australia. Mahjoub advocates two Islamic concepts to critique the existing regime of intellectual property rights and forge an alternative. Firstly, the concept of istikhlaf, which means trusteeship or stewardship. This Quranic concept means that God created the earth and all the resources entrusted to, uh, uh, and entrusted all the resources within it to human beings, his most intelligent creation. Thus, all resources remain equally open to everyone to benefit from. God's ownership of resources is manifested in common ownership for people dedicated to making everyone better off. The second concept Mahjoub draws upon is the tradition of Maqasid al-Sharia, which means the purposes or the objectives of the Sharia. Rooted in the writings of medieval ju jurists such as al juwaini al-Ghazali, al-Shatabi and al-Jawziya, this is a tradition that posits maslaha, which means public interest, as the ultimate goal of Islamic law. For example, al-Jawziya famously wrote, 
Sharia is founded on wisdom and social good of the people. All of its rules are dedicated to justice and welfare. Matters in which justice is re replaced with oppression or in which good is replaced with evil are not part of the Sharia. In the Maqasid tradition, public interest is usually understood as the protection and promotion of five things. Family, life, property, religion and intellect. Striking a balance between these purposes, or what might be called rights in modern parlance, is the key to achieving justice. Thus, the right to property is recognised as one of the objectives of the, sh of the Sharia, and there is no blanket rejection of notions of private ownership. Humankind will not be denied their individual rights to ownership, to reward labour, satisfy their intrinsic personal needs for personal possession, or to maximise resources to efficient levels. But the right to property is not absolute and should be balanced against the other form of qasid, for example, the protection of life and the protection and promotion of the intellect. With these two concepts in mind, istikhlaf and maqasid, Mahjub argues that an Islamic conception of property rights must operate within a broad framework of social justice. Society must create mechanisms capable of constantly adjusting intellectual property rights so that a balance between a fair reward for innovation and social justice can be found. This means that when an intellectual property right transforms into a substantial ability for a company to concentrate power over large markets or restrict potential opportunities to produce things essential to human well-being, it must be rearranged to restore a balance. For instance, if a pharmaceutical company creates an essential drug, such as a coronavirus vaccine, to cure a terrible illness by investing hundreds of millions of dollars and at the same time relying on public funding research, publicly funded research, we should be cautious about accepting arguments that such a company can rely on patent law to exercise broad control powers. We should also question the extent to which the corporation can exercise its monopoly to set prices prevent others from reverse engineering the drug or prevent others from producing generic versions of the drug, drug for deprived populations in poor countries. On this basis, an argument could be made from an Islamic perspective to temporarily waive the current patents on the coronavirus vaccines in order to facilitate more uh, equal access for all countries. In the longer term, the kind of vision of intellectual property rights articulated by scholars like Mahjoub might help formulate a more equitable intellectual property rights regime. Indeed, Mahjoub's analysis, though distinctly Islamic, has much in common with alternative perspectives on, on intellectual property rights coming from outside the Islamic tradition and might thus help to forge a new global consensus on this issue. This is just one example of how an Islamic vision of social justice inspired by Imam Ali and others within the Islamic tradition can contribute to tackling some of the most urgent challenges we face today. Thank you so much, Hadi, for an extremely insightful talk, which has great relevance to the events that are taking place in the world today. While you were speaking, several questions came to my mind, which I think would be of great interest to our viewers. My first question is, you referred in your talk to the influence of Caliph Imam Ali on Ali Shariati's writings and his attempts to restore Shiism to its essence. Perhaps you might share some thoughts on this connection and on Imam Ali's teachings on social justice. Thanks, Nadia. Yes, there are several instances um, of Imam Ali's vision of social justice in his letter to one of his uh, lieutenants, the Egyptian governor Malik al-Ashtar, which you mentioned in the introduction to this uh, talk. Uh, for example, in one part of the letter, Ali declares that people are either your brothers in religion or your like in creation, thus expressing a universalist vision which transcends re uh, religious differences. And this was something which Ali Shariati was also very much concerned with, um, especially in connection with uh, Sunni Shia sectarianism. Another part of the letter describes how the Imam came across an old blind Christian beggar and inquired about him. Um, and he implored the people around him 
uh, that, you know, you've employed this man to the point where he is old and infirm and now you've, you've left him to become a beggar. You should go to the, uh, the public treasury, the Beit al-Mal in, in Arabic, and help him with the money from the public treasury. So that episode can be seen as supporting a redistributive conception of social justice, which justifies social welfare from the rich to the poor. And it also, uh, you know, uh, implies the principle of religious equality between Muslim and non-Muslim. Of course, this is not the way that, this is, that, that these issues are always understood by all Shia scholars. Some of them are more conservative and they argue for a more minimalist conception um, of, of helping the poor, you know, providing the poor with the basic necessities for survival, um, rather than a more, uh, uh, you know, substantive redistribution of wealth. But there is plenty of uh, material in Imam Ali's teachings and in other parts of the Islamic tradition to call for a more robust uh, conception of social justice. That's so interesting. And it uh, leads me to a second question. What uh, aspects of Imam Ali's vision might intersect with this whole idea of trusteeship of creation that you raised um, by Izzuddin Mahjoub? I mean, what would be some of the implications that this might have on other problems in society, such as um, environmental preservation? Again, there's, uh, there is material in the letter to Malik al-Ashtar, um, uh, which might be seen as calling for environmental protection. For example, Imam Ali uh, called for people to look after the lands and to, for, to look after the animals on the lands. He also condemned people for fouling the water because there are living creatures in, in, in the water. And more broadly, Imam Ali's conception of social justice um, has been identified as a variety um, of what's called um, virtue ethics. Uh, this is something which uh, the, the, the distinguished scholar Reza Shah Kazami argues in his book about Al Imam Ali. Uh, virtue ethics is a kind of ancient tradition of ethics, which is about cultivating a more moral self using all sorts of techniques which can be spiritual techniques uh you know techniques which 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 create a kind of more disciplined self in order to change a particular bad habit um, and become a better person basically and some environmental uh activists today have uh endorsed or have called for the use of virtue ethics to cultivate um uh, you know character in people and in communities which is more um, compatible with environmental protection um, and sustainable development by changing people's lifestyles by you know the consumption patterns and things like that yes this whole area and this whole notion of trusteeship and the environment is really fascinating but perhaps let's turn to the whole issue of intellectual property rights which is also very interesting um, can you please just elaborate a little bit more on the various treaties which currently underpin the global regime of intellectual property rights? Yes, uh, as I mentioned briefly um, in the talk, the global intellectual property rights regime is, was largely constructed by, by the West. Um, and this found expression or was built up gradually in the form of a number of statutes First of all, the Statute of Venice of 1474, and then later on the Statute of Anne in 1710, and then the Berne Con uh, Convention of 1886, culminating in the TRIPS Agreement in 1995, um, which extended intellectual property rights to pharmaceutical products, as I mentioned, something which has, uh, you know, I think been very, very harmful, actually. Um, and this property rights regime has generally reflected the legislative and political agenda of uh, Western countries and of corporations within those countries. And the normative vision embedded in this global property rights regime is one which very much prioritizes protecting the rights of uh, the creators of these intellectual products, whatever they may be, which of course you could say is very, very important, but they have marginalized the, um, you know, the, the rights and well-being and the needs of marginalized uh, communities, especially in connection with things like access to medicine and access to school textbooks and things like that. It, it should be pointed out that there are clauses and exceptions and appendices to these acts. Um, for example, the TRIPS Act of 1995, which do allow for, uh, 
you know, exceptions to patents and copyrights to take place in situations, uh, you know, which might be an emergency. But generally speaking, they've been very, very restrictive, e even with those exceptions in place. Um, I mentioned uh, in the talk that South Africa um, had, had suffered um, under this regime when it uh, um, legislated for the production of unpatented AIDS medicine um, on its territory uh, in the 1990s. But a number of other countries have also uh, suffered under this regime, including Malaysia, Pakistan um, uh, and Brazil. Very interesting point. Well, from what I understand of the concept of intellectual property rights, it's a modern Western construct. I mean, it might be interesting if you could perhaps describe what precedents exist in the Muslim legal traditions for recognizing this whole intellectual property rights at all. Uh, you know, you mentioned broad principles of ikhtilaf, istikhlaf, and maqasid, but perhaps you might be a little bit more specific and, and just give us a bit of an understanding of that. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, so some Muslim scholars have argued that the concept of ownership, mulk in Arabic, is confined to tangible physical objects like land. Um, and, thus, uh, and so intellectual property rights are alien to the Islamic tradition and, and indeed are a colonial imposition that should be rejected. But as I mentioned, the majority of Muslim scholars accept the principle of intellectual property rights um, by saying, for example, that there's nothing in the Quran or the Hadiths which uh, prevents them from being recognized. Um, however, as I mentioned, their, their, their views remain somewhat underdeveloped. Um, and the starting point for scholars like Mahjoub, who've tried to start to develop this idea um, in a kind of Islamic framework, uh, one starting point for them might be the 14th century scholar Ibn Khaldun. And Ibn Khaldun started from the premise that, you know, the earth and all its natural products are kind of... Uh, created by God as a kind of trusteeship for human beings. So in that sense, they're held in common. But that once an individual mixes their labor with a particular natural product, that generates a property right to that product. Now, that actually is very, very similar to John Locke's conception of how a property right is generated. But of course, that property right should not be absolute and should be balanced against the other rights in the Makassi tradition, which we mentioned you know, for example, intellect and life yeah. um, and, and with the broader principles of social justice. It shouldn't be an absolute right in that respect. Thank you so much, Hadi. Unfortunately, time doesn't permit further discussion on these extremely important issues. Um, I would like to bring this event to a close by quoting a saying attributed to Khalif Imam Ali, where he says, let the most beloved of affairs to you be the most centered on the right. And on that note, I would like to thank Dr. Hadi Anayat for his incredibly thought-provoking talk and for spending time with us on this occasion of Yomi Ali. I would like to thank you all for participating in today's event and to wish you a safe, healthy, happy rest of the day. Thank you, good day. Ma'asalama <laughs> Sophia <laughs> Oh,
خوشگو